Good morning, and welcome to our Unitarian Universalist Cooperative Summer Worship Series for 2020. I'm Kendall Gibbons, Senior Minister at the All Souls UU Church in Kansas City, Missouri. When our congregations pivoted suddenly to online worship back in March, in response to the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, we all had to invent new formats and adapt to new technologies instantly. Many of our ministers and tech staff and volunteers rose to the occasion with great creativity and skill. Now, during our traditional summer break and study time, we take this opportunity to share our discoveries and learn from each other through a series of virtual visits to Sunday services with a cluster of our neighbor congregations. Through the gift of online worship, you will hear from some of our newest up and coming young preachers and some of our wisest senior colleagues. You will experience how a variety of congregations have embraced the challenges of these new formats and our sound, video, and streaming tech folks will enjoy a little well-deserved time off. Look for our separate community online gatherings to resume in September. We hope that today's message will rouse your spirit and resonate with your soul. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, where we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning on YouTube. On Sunday morning, whether in our building or on YouTube, we throw open the doors of the church, proclaiming the radical welcome and love that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And in the summer of 2020, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place and time to practice transformation. Who can you be? How will you be in the world? In times of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what is the highest and best selves we are called to be? This is where we practice. We begin this morning, wherever you are, by taking a moment to center yourself in the space and time you are in. Let go of what you have been carrying. Be present in this moment, this space. Take a few deep breaths and let us begin. Today's chalice lighting comes to us from the Reverend Sean Dennison in praise of praise. Yes, even now when so much is broken, praise tears that will not be held back, witness to the immeasurable beauty of the smile of a six-year-old gunned down by those who praise nothing. Yes, even now when so much is at risk, Praise the blood that pulses its systole and diastole rhythm, dancing to and from the heart, even when the sky is smoke and our masks have become an ordinary necessity. 
Yes, even now when so much is struggle, praise bodies that sweat and tremble, muscles tense with embodied comprehension that we are headed the wrong way and the ir irresistible urge to change direction, a glorious, clumsy prodigal return. Yes, especially now when so much is at stake, praise something, anything, so alive and extravagant that it awakens and calls you to discard despair, abandon apathy, and praise whatever brings you back to life. My name is Chelsea Kraska, and I am the Director of Religious Education at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Today, we're going to be reading a story called Stay Through the Storm. There's a storm coming. It's brewing in the distance, heading our way. But stay, stay through the storm. I'll be with you. I'll hold your umbrella. We'll find your warmest coat and your shiny rain boots. We'll splash through puddles, and when the wind begins to blow, we'll run inside. So stay, don't leave me. I'll stay with you. As the rain pours down on the roof, we'll sit by the fire, sipping hot cocoa, and play our favorite game. And when the storm picks up and bolts of lightning flash across the sky, you might wonder if it will ever end. But stay, stay through the storm. I'll be right here. We'll be safe together. 
When the thunder roars, we can make a fort and count the seconds between the lightning and thunder so we'll know whether the storm is close or far. And when you're scared, you can tell me. I get scared sometimes too. Stay with me. And when the wind howls and all the lights go out, we'll find flashlights. So stay. You don't have to be alone. I'll stay with you through this storm and the next. And when the storm passes, we'll go outside and find a rainbow arching all the way across the sky. But most of all, we'll find that we are stronger together because we stayed with each other. And before the next storm comes and the darkness blocks the light again, we'll make a promise to be together. Stay with me. I'll stay with you. And we'll never be alone. And that is the end of our story. March 15th of 2020 was one of the hardest days of my ministry, at least so far. The Thursday before, on March 12th, the safety response team here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln had met over Zoom and decided that in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we would close the church building, effective Monday the 16th. We decided to stay open for one more weekend, in part to tell the congregation in person and in part because I don't think any of us had really come to terms with what was happening. At least for me, I can say that I did not leave public policy, spend half a decade racking up student loans, graduate from seminary, interview, get called, move to Nebraska so that I could be the minister who presided over closing a church. March 15th was the last time we gathered for worship in this sanctuary. Jill Jarvis, preached and we distributed as many hard copies of a guide to logging on to Zoom and YouTube as we could. This is the beginning of my fourth year in Lincoln. And for most of that time, when colleagues have been from back east have asked, how are things in Nebraska? I would answer, this congregation is alive. I come to work to, at the office on a Tuesday morning and, and dodge Montessori kids playing out front, then wave to the retirees arriving for Ali classes before settling down in my office to write a sermon, <laughs> sermon writing that is interrupted in a solid stream by our members dropping by the office to say hi. As difficult as those interruptions are for an introvert minister, they are profoundly beautiful. More than just about anywhere I've served, there is a feeling about this place that it is alive. Our services are loud. We try new things. The congregation, bless them, laughs at jokes in worship. So when I tell you that I struggled in mid-March, you should know this. The thing that I have loved for years about this community became the thing that we had to move away from quickly. This sense of busyness, vitality, possibility that felt like electricity every time we gathered in this place became a sense of anxiety. And a question, are we doing the right thing? Because how could we possibly capture the joy of being together in this new world that we've been thrown into? How on earth, how do I say with a straight face that we are a church practicing social distancing, whatever social distancing means, 
when I have said for years that the reason that churches are important as institutions is that they meet our profound need as hum human beings to connect with each other in person, to gather and recognize our shared humanity, our imperfections and beauty. How could we do that on Zoom? Ultimately, I think this is a question of hope. Hope in its most straightforward sense, wanting the world as it is to be more like the world as it ought to be. To know that things are imperfect and believe that they might be just a little bit different. If we can't imagine what or how the world ought to be, how we might do this thing. Where do we find hope? In March, we knew a storm was coming, and as much as we wanted to say as a church, and as the story this morning put it, that when the storm picks up and bolts of lightning flash across the sky, you might wonder if it will ever end, but stay. Stay through the storm. I'll be right there. We'll be safe together. It's hard to say that because the ways we've stayed together through storms in the past had to change. Staying afloat in this difficult time is done by keeping a tight grip on hope and a tight grip, even if it's a virtual grip, on community. Each week we mark joys and sorrows when we gather together here. We share our lives, the things that are joyful developments, as well as sorrowful weights. As the next song plays and you enjoy the music, please feel free to type your name or the name of someone that you're holding in your heart, whether it's with joy or sorrow. Type it in the chat box to the right of this video. I wish you
now these three remain, the Apostle Paul wrote, hope, faith, and love. Faith, hope, and love, that is. But the greatest of these is love. And yeah, without love, our words are empty. They are like a banging cymbal and sounding gong. Unitarian Universalists are the love people. Without love, we are empty. The UUA board this summer charging a task force to re-examine our seven principles told it to root its work in love as a principal guide in its work, attending particularly to the ways that we and our root traditions have understood and articulated love and how we have acted out of love. I have preached on love. I will preach on love. Our whole universalist tradition is grounded in an understanding of expansive love that proclaims that everyone, every one, is beloved. I don't struggle much with love. I know it every day I see my daughter. I know it most days when I sit down to record a three to five minute video for the congregation I serve. My life has been transformed by love and I will preach about that for the rest of my life. I don't struggle much with love. I struggle with hope. There's a story in the Hebrew scripture of Jacob. Jacob is described as a calculating, whip-smart young man who flees from his home after cheating his brother Esau out of his inheritance. Years later, Jacob returns home to either reconcile with his family or be held accountable for his actions. And on the night before he meets his brother, he goes to a cave to pray. He doesn't know what's about to happen. And he's met there by a stranger, an angel, who he wrestles with until dawn, demanding a blessing for the days to come. And while Jacob is hurt in the struggle, the angel eventually blesses him, naming Jacob Israel, one who has struggled with the divine. Finding hope in the midst of pandemic and reckoning with our legacies of inequality and trauma and climate change feels a little like wrestling with an angel, hoping we can find a blessing, demand a blessing before our hip gives in. One of the reasons I struggle with hope is that I am a relatively concrete thinker. I came to this job out of public policy, and public policy, you could say, is, is defined by the articulation in concrete terms of hope. I find myself these days wanting something concrete, something solid to hold on to, some sense that in X months, with Y as an intervention, that will result in outcome Z. Of course, that's not the world we live in right now. I don't think we do ourselves or our congregations any favors when we pretend that hope is easy to find. But Paul didn't put hope right there with faith and love because it is easy. To have hope is to understand, even in this moment, that this is not the only possible world. The poet Adrian Rich wrote, My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. This is the essence of hope, to cast our lot with those who, age after age, reconstitute the world. Hope anchors us, connects us with that sense of possibility, of reconstitution. Even for us concrete thinkers, it gives us a thing to hold on to, and in doing that, it allows us to move forward. I want to be very clear about one thing. The members of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, and I suppose everyone watching this, know that I have over the last decade of my life struggled with both anxiety and clinical depression. 
So I hope you understand that, that I know what I'm saying when I tell you that there are times when you can't find hope and the answer is not prayer or community, but medical help. And even for a person who's, whose job is what it is for me, untangling the difference between existential anxiety and clinical depression can be really, really hard. And so it is always better to err on the side of asking for help and figuring it out with professionals. But given that caveat, there's a place for religious communities in finding hope because it's in these places, whether online or in person, that we practice the world that we hope for. And when we get it right, and we don't always, but when we get it right, UU congregations give us a kind of harbor in the midst of uncertainty, a, a port to pause in during the storm before venturing out again. If we couple hundred people in Lincoln, Nebraska, or Kansas City, or Columbus, Ohio can be together as a community of diverse background and theology with a shared commitment to justice and a better world, then who's to say that a better world isn't possible in the fullness of time? Who's to say that we shouldn't hope? Love is too much for one poem by Sean Dennison. Love is too much for one poem. It bears repetition, needs it, to get to all its complexities, the things that make you wonder if anyone believes or begins to fathom it at all. How could they? Things are never what they seem, never what one hopes when love is involved. All the possibilities are only that, only things that could be, and nothing really endures because love changes us all, every one of us. Things are never what they seem. Three plus three is suddenly seven, and things that were are no longer, and yet we endure because we long for love and keep faith with it beyond all boundaries all hope, all reason. Love is too much for one poem, but still we try. We cannot help ourselves. The subject demands it of us, demands our greatest effort, the work of an entire lifetime, though we know these words will never be enough and our effort is destined for failure. Still, we capture what we can and love. Václav Havel, the Czech statesman and literary figure, wrote that hope is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or of willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously heading for success but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. Havel writes that hope is being anchored beyond the horizons of the experienced world. Hope is not being content with the world as it is. And we're pretty good at that as Unitarian Universalists. We are well-versed at discontent, and we are clear and getting clearer about pointing to the injustices of the world and proclaiming that this is wrong. But where I think we struggle is in making the positive case right now. The case that not only critiques the world as it is, but points to the world as it ought to be. 
What is the anchor somewhere out beyond the horizon that draws us on? Usually when we think of anchors, we think of them as something to keep us in place, to hold, to hold us, to anchor us, literally, to hold us steady as the world around us moves. But historically, and in sailing, there's at least one other use for an anchor. So imagine for a moment you're on a sailing ship in the 19th century. It's big, 150, maybe 200 feet long. There aren't any motors or oars on the ship itself. The ship is designed to work with the wind. And when you're out at the open sea with the wind at your back, the ship just flies. But how do you get out of port? What do you do when the wind isn't at your back but coming straight in your face? What do you do when you're stuck in the doldrums, no wind to be had at all? There's a process in sailing called warping. You take a kedge anchor, a kind of C-shaped anchor, and put it in a rowboat, and a crew rows it as far as they can out in front of the ship, 100 yards, 200 yards, and then drops the anchor. And the crew left aboard the ship hull on the anchor line, not to bring the anchor up, but to bring the ship slowly over top of it. And then the crew pulls the anchor up, puts it back on the rowboat, and the rowboat rows another hundred yards, drops the anchor, and repeats the process. It is not a fast process, and it is back-breaking work. But in this way, even the largest ship can move forward. So we can think of an anchor as a kind of quite literal motivation when the wind is against us. And that is also a distinctive aspect of hope. Because unlike a kind of naive optimism, hope does not require that the wind be at our backs is not more to a certain understanding of the experienced world. Rather, hope is a kind of faith statement anchoring us, but anchoring us over the horizon, past what we can see. And that's what we need right now, because make no mistake, the months since we closed the building here in Lincoln have been some of the hardest of this congregation's history the profound challenge of the movement for black lives requires those of us who have moved through the world with privilege to do hard, at times thankless work, to engage and change the systems that we've set up and participated in for generations. There is a presidential election of some consequence coming up in less than 90 days. And underlying and interweaving through it all is the existential threat of climate change. And so if this sermon carries the sailing metaphor forward, then right now we are in the midst of a huge storm when the wind cannot be counted on to help us move forward. And I, I still can't articulate exactly what I hope for in this moment. Hope is the thing I struggle with, a better world, yes. Specifics are harder. But I can tell you that I feel it every time I log on to Zoom and I see our members' faces. I feel it when I show up at Nebraska's Capitol building with a few thousand of my closest friends all wearing masks but seeing each other as clearly as we have in years. I hear it when my daughter learns a new word. I know it when we gather on Sunday. And so like the story goes, when the wind howls and all the lights go out, we'll find flashlights. So stay, you don't have to be alone. I'll stay with you through this storm and the next. And when the storm passes, we'll go outside and find a rainbow arcing all the way across the sky. But most of all, 
will find that we were stronger because we stayed with each other. And before the next storm comes and the darkness blocks the light again, we'll make a promise to be together. So hold on to hope. Drop an anchor out over the horizon and we will go there together. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. Each week, we take up an offering to support this congregation and our partners in the wider world. We do this because we all benefit from this congregation in ways both seen and unseen. And we all give back to the congregation in ways both seen and unseen, whether that be volunteering, financially working on the grounds, making sure there's beautiful art in our gallery. There are many, many ways that we engage with the work in this church. While we're in this time of physical distancing and outside of our building, we give primarily through text on Sunday morning. So if you would like to try text giving this morning, simply text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Again, that's UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your generosity. I am you are me. That's what I said. I am you are me. Don't you see? I am you are me. That's what I said. I am you are me. Don't you see? I am you are me. That's what I said. I am you are me. Don't you see?
As we close our time together and extinguish our chalice, the ask is a simple one. Be the church. Because hope is not an individual endeavor, we grow in hope when we grow in community and in love. So reach out to each other. Embody hope in your communities. Be the church. And we'll do it together. Amen.